Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The subject is deep, the time is short. Let the show begin right now <laughs> with this question. Media and migration, are they friends or foes? This is, you will have guessed, a rhetorical question. And because it is a rhetorical question, I will hasten to answer it. It is what we make of it. And I will tell you very shortly what that is. Um, that being said, it is also appropriate to note that there are certain features on both sides that do not make this a natural pairing. There are challenges on both sides. There are divergent functions and aims. For instance, the media is focused on news and novelty, on human interest content, on accessible, simple, and high impact formats, while on the other hand, we have a very complex phenomenon that is large scale, that is longer trends, and to address it and understand it, we need longer term strategies, resources, and commitment. Other differing and opposing features are along these lines. The media is becoming increasingly fragmented. It's got to the point of pure bewilderment what is out there. It is, as was often in the past, but increasingly so, opinionated and politicized. It is also facing new challenges to its authority, to its role, and of course, to its economic model. On the other hand, we have migration, which has seen exponential growth in volume and speed. It has broader and deeper impact on most aspects of our societies, and it's becoming an established feature of our day-to-day -day lives. All in all, because of this, but of other factors too, it would be quite safe to say that it has been a rough and unproductive relationship. And that the broader migration story, I hate to use military metaphors, but they're simple, they carry the message. And for the day, they will do. It's been a lost battle. It has been largely a lost battle because the migration story in its broader shape is one of crisis, it is one of differences and disparities, it is one of divisiveness, them versus us, it is one of quick short-term fixes, shortages, and economic and social hardship. When in fact, this story should have been, and can be, something completely different. One of beneficial evolution, one of communality, one of inclusiveness, one of fairness, one of resources, and development and progress. Now it is very easy, looking at all the features of the media, to say, we're dealing with an ignorant, famished, and self-serving beast, like all institutions tend to become after a certain while. It is also natural to say that some of the biggest fears of the media, considering what an industry it has become, is the blank page, the blank screen, and silence, and that they will honor, even worship, those that help address them. And they are many, and not always, the best documented. The media has inherent limitations, and we need to say in the same breath that it also has incredible strengths. That is why the media is such an easy scapegoat. But I've been a practitioner myself, and I know from the inside that this is, at a minimum, disingenuous. Because on the other hand, we have the practitioners. Let's define them very broadly as governments, international bodies, and the entire pro-migrant establishment. Well, things haven't gone too well on this side either, because what we had, there have been decades upon decades when the best policy, communication policy in terms of migration was deemed to be silence. Silence is golden. While it didn't turn out to be that golden, these are chickens that have come home to roost right now, haven't they? And unfortunately, the space has been taken. There's been a lot of ignorance because you need to know your classics when you speak about migration. There are many, many cliches and caricatures around. There's been inappropriate language, imagery, and messaging, and we've communicated most of what we had to communicate in inappropriate formats, and our engagement with the media has been clearly insufficient. To make this story short, it's very clear that on this side too, we have been falling short. 
We have tried to fight this battle on the moral high ground, on principles, on issues of intellectual ascendancies, on facts, even simple arithmetic, and even economic self-interest. But they are the wrong tools. These are not the tools with which we're going to win the story battle and the media battle. They are much, much simpler. We're talking about volume. That matters. And by volume, I mean mass. I mean loudness. We are talking about staying power, to say this message day in and day out. And we are talking about practical intelligence. Practical intelligence for what? Well, practical intelligence to find the words, the sounds, and the images to put together powerful stories. And not just a few stories, many powerful stories. I also want us to be very clear what the task is. This is not about filling an information deficit. In these days and times, I think most of us have more information than we need to kill ourselves many times over. This is about creating and managing perceptions and influencing attitudes and behavior. Now, this is a more complex tool, but a doable one. All I'm trying to say is that it's a different beast altogether. Now, I have spent most of my professional time working in the media. and or with the media. And I recognize that it has a very important role to play. And there is definitely a lot of space for media campaigning. But my horizon of expectation in this area is low. I don't think many good things will come from here. We need something much broader, something called social dialogue and interaction. And any media or, let's say, media activity that will be directed towards this social dialogue and interaction will be uh, a very well-guided effort. And social dialogue and interaction, remember that, is something we used to be very good at not too long ago. And there are still among us some with considerably fewer gadgets who remind us how good we were. How are we going to improve this dialogue? I'm going to touch on three points. A better story, a better relation, and a better, broader framework. Let's begin here. Who are the real characters? Now, the real characters refer to what is a typical migrant. Let me answer that very quickly. There is no such thing as a typical migrant. Uh, there is a bewilderment of typologies out there. Now. Media-induced public perception would have you that this is a typical migrant, the one risking his life across the Mediterranean trying to reach the greener pastures of Europe, or the young undocumented male jumping fences uh, and coming through whatever means into Europe. But in fact, we're looking at a different set of characters. It's more likely to be someone like him who keeps the wheels of our economy spinning, or even more important, women, whose story doesn't get told that often. Women who prop up and are the life and blood of essential security uh, and social systems that we have in place. In fact, we're missing out on such a rich diversity of people, and I will show you just a few. Some are well-known, famous migrants, others less known, all remarkable in their own way. And each with a story that is just waiting to be told, but unfortunately, isn't, for reasons that escape me. My favorite is the last picture that came on the screen, the young the Korean couple. They left their South Korean home country decades ago with barely a suitcase between themselves. Now they employ 40,000 people. So much for people that lack resources and initiative. The better story is also something that gets away from this obsession with irregular migration and moves into the biggest story of migration and regular migration. If by miracle tomorrow we manage to stop irregular migration, there will still be considerable numbers of people that come in through regular channels for family reunification alone. But there are other channels indeed. We obsess over irregular entrance when, in fact, most people enter through regular channels and become visa overstayers. And we also obsess about refugees, which are indeed a very sad and very important story, but the biggest story is missed out on and is that of migrants. 
there is one in seven people who can qualify as a migrant. 230 million about international migrants, the rest internally displaced people. Now, very quickly, I want to show you something about the real places of departure and where do they come from. Now, the point of this chart is to look at it very quickly. We don't want to do statistical analysis here. This, these are OECD figures. And what they say fundamentally in two snapshots, 2000 and 2015, is that most migrants come from middle-income countries. Migration is not about importing or, if you prefer, exporting poverty. If your plan is migration, you will drop some change on that. The other thing is, where do these people actually go? Now, again, this chart is complicated. We don't want to analyze that in detail. Again, the figures are from the OECD. But I call your attention to the shapes. You see, most of them look like a two-legged trouser with flare bottoms. What that means, actually, is that people move very close by. Sorry. They move from their place of origin to something very close by. And that applies also to Europe, which is at the bottom of the shape there, the dark blue shape. Most of migration in Europe happens from Europe. Now, the better stories also concern the nature of the migration experience. We associate it with long-term plans. But in fact, it's more and more this and this. We are talking about mobility and short-term mobility. There is enough evidence out there to suggest, and IOM has done its own studies on the issue, average migration project is between three and five years. Now, the better story would also begin with us pitching the story at the right level, because our stories are a bit too abstract, too general. Everybody's favorite indicator, remittances. Huge impact on world economy, and here is the estimate for 2017, which is actually lower than the years before, 444 billion. Now, it's an interesting story, but is it memorable? I would dare to say no. So let's try something different. Same story, Muhammad. Muhammad is a New York cabbie. And what Muhammad does is with his money, you shouldn't expect fortunes as a taxi driver. I think we all know that. If he's a family of four in the host country, and at the same time, 15 relatives in his home country. Now, this is a different story. So the next time you go to New York, don't forget to hail Muhammad, and you'll be contributing to a good cause. Let's try along the same line something different. Now, the role of women in migration, which is growing by the day. And there we have the usual chart. They currently make up almost half of worldwide migration flows, and they succeed in spite of much greater difference, difficulties than men. Again, very interesting stories, but not one that I would actually take away with me. Let's try something different. Let's try Anusha. Now, Anusha left Iran with her family when she was 14. Beginnings were rough. She slept on the floor. She lived all by herself, wondering where her next meal would come from. Currently, she's a chemical engineer with an MBA. She owns and runs a pollution control company. And she has 100 employees employed that generate over 10 million in annual revenue. Someday, Anusha may just make the air more breathable for all of us. Now, the point that I'm trying to make with these stories is a simple one. We need to get close and personal to a human, individual level. Because this is the story that will carry the day with the media and through them, with their readership and audiences worldwide. The biggest, the better story also refers to the migrants' voices, which need to be heard. Because unfortunately, they're not heard enough. They are misrepresented, misunderstood, and they are not supported by key multipliers. That's a bigger and sadder story. We're not going to get into that today. The better story also refers to the story that we need to say in schools, to our kids, where this subject is conspicuously absent. And the, big, the better story also refers to the one that needs to be told by businesses, because they have an increasingly bigger role to play in migration issues and also key in integration. What will happen when all these come together? Something very important. 
will transpire from all of this. It's this idea of commonality. Commonality of ideals and aspirations, commonality of values, and commonality of purpose. I am not telling you new things here. This is known since the beginning of times when we could spell basic human behavior. When you get people in contact and define common goals, what you will have is a common project. And it is this idea, if anything, that I would like you to take away with you from today, this idea of the common project. Because it reduces negative behavior and conflict, it facilitates tolerance and cooperation, and it, has, it is known to have deep and long-lasting effects. This is well, well documented. What does the common project look like? It's very simple. It looks like talking and debating together. It looks like learning together. It looks like eating together. Someone said that integration passes through the stomach. I agree heartily with that. <laughs> it also means playing together. It means living together. No less importantly, it means working together. Now, the better relation also passes through a better relation, which has to be a managed process. I am aware that this is a huge subject, so what I've done here is I put it all on one slide, and we will discuss it at, a, at another time. But what I'm trying to say is that you need a whole range of tools in order to have this turn into a more fruitful, beneficial relation for both sides. I use a lot, just like many other practitioners, ready-to-use press kits. I have human interest stories, and I cultivate a network of interested and very capable journalists which I provide, just as many of my colleagues, regular formal and informal provision of information at any moment of the day or night. Availability is an important feature of this relationship. And I also forward, give them forward notice and exclusivity because that matters, this exchange of gifts. And I also involve them in sponsorship and direct involvement in certain activities or projects that we carry out, you will be surprised how willing the media is to be part of these. Now, a better media means, of course, better channels of communication. I don't really want to speak about this because this is, in a sense, talking shop, talking technique. And one thing I've learned working in communication is that everything is there. Sooner or later, you will find the right tools. You shouldn't worry about that. You should worry about the bigger scheme of things, what it is you want to say, what are the aims of your communication, so on and so forth. But there are certain things that I would nevertheless like to say, because I see almost this obsession nowadays with online outreach and social media. I don't want you to get me wrong, because IOM, together with other UN agencies, have a massive online footprint. And it is a battle that must be fought. Because if we leave this ground open, somebody else will take it. It's already been taken. But by and large, I would have to say that when it comes to social media and integration, I would have to consider it a very inefficient medium. At least in my experience. The impact is very limited, almost evanescent. You are going in a place of division, tribalism, and downright anti-social behavior. You want to talk integration issues on social media, you will be slaughtered these days. Or at best, you will be preaching to the converted. At least that has been our experience to date. Also, it is a non-authoritative medium. I'll show you shortly after what I mean by that. And its main focus is interaction among peers, as opposed to what we are trying to achieve, which is inclusion, engagement, influencing perceptions, and even more importantly, educating. There is also the perception that social media is something cost efficient. Well, it isn't. You need a lot of capacity because when those invectives start flying, you need to manage the conversation. You need moderators. You need all sorts of specialized people. We have jobs like community managers, so on and so forth that do this. So you quickly run into an issue of costs if you want to do social media effectively. Impact at the same time, I find it very confusing. Some of those metrics, you can drive a truck through very easily, if not a whole fleet of trucks. 
and it's a very high noise medium. I'll give you just one example here. Luis Fonsi and his Despacito. This is the most viewed piece of information on the face of the earth. Now, this is not sarcasm or cheap moralizing. It is just a fact. And what I'm trying to say here is the following. I don't want to compete for that. I don't want to compete with this ground, with, on this ground because our voice will not be heard. It is as simple as that. And that is why my preference would go towards other media which are more authoritative, like larger scale outdoor display media. Whether in places like that or we're talking bus stops, we're talking subway stations, we're talking airport conveyor belts, indoor media, institutional and business spaces. This is the media that is there in your face, day in, day out. And yes, I like the fact that you can't talk back to it. We also had great success with event communication, whether that is conferences such as days, sports events, or all sorts of other things. And in a day when everybody is going digital, I still prefer, prefer the huge and immediate impact of print. But most of all, I'm very fond of this, because this is where I believe it will all happen, namely in direct group and community dialogue and engagement. Any media activity that supports this is media well used for our purposes. I would like to say a few words about our messaging and some of the things that we've done ourselves, the people that defend migration and integration. These are just two examples out of many. There are hundreds out there about campaigns trying to elicit sympathy. Uh, I could have easily found any other. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that with all the best intentions, we are confirming some stereotypes and some cliches about refugees and migrants. We're using the wrong tool, the wrong images and words. We're projecting an image of helplessness, destituteness, and loss. This is not the right approach. Same thing, let me give you a few quick examples. These, again, I picked up at random. <laughs> now, my question to you is, what, if anything, good do we expect to come out of this? What are people supposed to say seeing this? Oh, I have a small brain. I need something to enlarge on it very, very quickly. And my life is ruined because I'm a racist. No, that just does not work. I mean, we will be using more or less the same vocabulary as they do. Racism, xenophobia, intolerance. I even reject these terms because, to be quite frank, if you look at them, they have very strong psychological and social basis, these things that we call racism, xenophobia, and intolerance. But much of the, let's say, opposition, negative reaction to migration is not because of these. One clear result of using words like these in doing campaigns like this, we all know what it is. It is division. And we are stocked up full on that. Now, in my closing section, I want to focus a little bit on that broader framework which I mentioned. Communication doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates in a much, much bigger context. And no matter how good we will be, if we do not address some of the issues in the broader context, we will just be howling in a tempest and not be heard. Now, first of all, we need to address our migration-related challenges because they are real these migration challenges. There are economic, social, and of late, even big security concerns. Uh, as I said, these are very, very real. The second thing is keeping numbers within limits. Now, migration is not intended to be a mass sport. As soon as it becomes something massive, you have problems of integration, problems of capacity, and you have all sorts of problems, and I am particularly concerned uh, about this because I'm looking at with an immigrant's eyes because I myself am an immigrant and I am worried about what we have to offer these people. We are concerned about the welfare of migrants and what awaits them. If all we have to offer them is a cubicle and very uncertain, a very uncertain future and a third class status, then we will have failed in our job. At the same time, if you have masses of people 
moving from one place to another, you're not solving problems. You're actually running away from them. And then there is this thing about looking after effective populations and economic sectors. Migration will generate losers and winners, but the benefits are not equally spread around. They're all too concentrated in a few hands. And this is not, I hasten to say, the result or the direct result of only migration. Let's chalk it all up to that thing we call globalization. But some people make a very simple analysis. I'm losing my job. New people are coming in. Who's to blame? So these concerns need to be looked into because they are real and they influence the perception of migration. There is also something that we need to correct, which is that of the broader image and understanding of migration. It is perceived as something that is external to host societies. We're here, we're doing fine, and all of a sudden we have all these people coming over. But it is not external to our societies. It is also an internal factor. Migration happens because we are what we are, and we have made the choices that we made in terms of lifestyles, in terms of economies, and in terms of values. There are big internal draws to this phenomenon. And it is directly related to our economic well-being, <coughs> sorry, social cohesion and peace, and to our key democratic values. This is also something that we need to work to make it well understood. The final thing that I would like to look at, some say demogra demography is destiny. I'm not truly convinced, but we would definitely be well advised to have a look at this. Again, some figures here for 2050 projections, and they come from the Population Reference Bureau. Now, 2050, that's just around the corner. It's a generation away. It's not that far. Now, let's have a look at this. World population, 9.8 billion. That's up 31%. There will be considerably more of us in a very short time. Africa's population will more than double to 2.6 billion. It's the same story elsewhere. Uh, I just chose Africa because it is a bit more striking in terms of the figures. We're looking at 57% of global population growth. And Africa's youth population will rise to 35% of total world population from 20% today. All this is happening in the place where there are the fewest possible jobs on the face of the earth. Migration will increase. There will be more and more of it. The pressure is huge. And this will happen not because of migration, but there aren't that many options around, to be quite frank, because the divisions that we see at a domestic level are also mirrored at an international level. We have divisions there, and we have many, many broken things. We need to fix those broken things. Now, this brings us back to what I said previously. We need, first of all, to correct these imbalances. And one sure way of doing that is through devising a common project. This is the story that we need to tell to the media and through the media, day in, day out, loud and often. And most of all, we need to tell it to a very, very special audience that, to my mind, is the most important of them all. We need to tell it to them. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.